Okay, um, so I, uh, Dennis offered me a slot to talk about whatever I wanted, so I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing in clock synchronization. Generally, I'm going to say why I, what it is, what I call clock synchronization, why I got interested in it, why it turns out to be a little bit of a challenging problem. Um, it turns out that we all use a clock synchronization algorithm called NTP, and I'll say why it didn't quite work for us in this situation. I um, talk about the, a clock synchronization algorithm that we <laughs> actually came up with, Huygens, and how it works, and then talk a little bit about both future work and sort of alternatives related work. Okay, this, you know, what I say clock synchronization, being kind of a software person, you know, my mental model is you got a collection of machines, you know, we're looking at machines in a data, in a data center. Each of them has something that tries to keep track of time of day, you know, you know what, what time it is and things. And so the, the question be, uh, is if you went and were able to simultaneously ask each of those machines what time it is, um, what time would you get? And there's sort of a, you know, kind of a famous saying and, you know, it's sort of this kind of business of a, a person with a wristwatch knows what time it is, a person with two watches has no idea. And the reason is, you know, like these things, no matter what we do, there are different kind of systems and different clock domains that read return a different value. So um, the reason we kind of got interested in this, you know, Balaji and I was kind of a simple thing. We were looking around at network, um, you know, machines connected by a network, and we wanted to be able to send a packet from one machine to the other in time how long it took. And so it's relatively easy for us to like just start a stop, look at the time of day clock on one machine and then immediately send the packet out. And then when it arrives at the other machine, look at the time of day clock and get two time values. The problem we ran, ran into, if you do something like sub, take the receive time and uh, subtract the transmit time to get the time it took to send a packet, we would repeatedly get things like big negative numbers. And the problem here is the clocks in those two machines are sort of screwy. So we, we're trying to think, well, these machines in our data center, maybe we could like make this work by sort of synchronizing the clocks up. This led us to kind of understand a little bit how clocks uh, are kept and time is kept in a, a computer system. If, you know, most systems, if you drill down low enough, there's some kind of crystal oscillator in there that sort of sits there and, and oscillates. Um, it, you know, they kind of, I guess, a little bit of a miracle of manufacturing. They're able to take these things and like cut a little quartz crystal such that it operates at pretty close to this frequency they want in these things. And so what we do, you put one of these things in, you know what it's supposed to be sort of um, frequency it's running at, and you just count the number of ticks it has and you get a notion of time out of it. And so, you know, this is, you know, how these systems work. And there's two sort of issues, one of which is, you know, these manufacturers good, but it's not perfect. And that, you know, basically, if you look at the spec of these parts, you know, depending on how much you pay, you know, they'll, they'll list them as saying it's accurate to like six parts per million, which, you know, in our world means it's accurate to like six microseconds in one second. So, you know, not, not that super accurate. Even worse, they have figures like this that show if you vary the temperature, what happens to the frequency of this thing. Uh, curious thing is, you know, if you operate near like 25 Celsius uh, with this particular part, um, you know, you basically would be close to what the manufacturer frequency, but if your temperature varied from that, you're going to slow down, regardless of whether it got warmer or, cold, or colder in there. And if you look at the units here on the side, these are effectively microseconds. You could end up, you know, like if the thing heats up and you know, having the frequency kind of go south on you in a, in a hurry. And so one of the things that this has been, you know, you, we see with our, you know, clock sync is, you know, you start the machine doing something, you know. I'm 
the microphone stop? Yeah, that's bad. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So anyhow, we basically, um, if you got, you know, you, like we were looking at clocks on network interface cards, you send a bunch of packets out and your clock frequency cha and changes on you and stuff. So this is sort of an inkling of what, you know, sort of can go wrong, you know, what makes this a hard problem. Um, when we started um, working, we were actually collaborating with a major uh, cloud provider whose name starts with G. And um, b basically, uh, they gave us a nice cluster of, event, you know, advanced cluster they're putting together. And we ran some experiments just looking at the sort of clocks on their machines and stuff. And they tell us they actually paid extra for their clocks, so they're better than the average ones and stuff. And so, big cluster, what this is showing you is the difference in clock frequency, um, you know, clock drift in microseconds per second across all the pairs of machines in there. And you can see it's got a nice sort of, you know, distribution, but the tail of it goes out to like 30 microseconds per second. And so, what it means is that, you know, if you just let these things, you know, run, try to keep time, they're going to be off pretty quickly. So let's say you're running NTP, you know, the NTP spec basically is, you know, from an age of the early running over the internet and stuff, and so not wanting to do lots of traffic, it exchanges messages around. of a disaster if you're trying to actually program to it means, you know, with that kind of drift, you're in the hundreds of microseconds up to milliseconds sort of range, you know, in terms of the skew and the clocks between things. So anyhow, um, we decided to take a look at this and came up with this algorithm. A couple of things, you know, one of which was really focused on data centers. We were interested about it. And there's been a long history of people, you know, like taking you know, the data centers were started just using pretty much off the shelf, both hardware and software. And now, you know, slowly we're written, you know, everything's being customized for it. And so we decided to take a shot at NTP. You know, and in this world, we basically have a pretty impressive interconnect. They have these sort of fat trees in there that have very, you know, you know, very high performance, you know, high bisection bandwidth and stuff. It's also, you're relatively close, you know, it's not like the internet, you know, you basically send a message, it's pretty bounded in how long it's gonna bounce around that network before it comes out the other end and stuff. And so we thought about sort of, you know, can, what, what, what can we do? And as I mentioned, Balaji was one of the main instigators here in his re research group. A couple of things we sort of decided on, one of which is we've got to adjust the clocks much more frequently than once a minute, you know, like um, since, you know, you're just going to be dead with the way the oscillators sort of work. The other thing we did was most of the clock algorithms just um, look at, you know, how far your clock is off and try to correct it. We decided we wanted to sort of model these oscillators we know about. They're sitting there running and their frequency is drift, you know, drifting apart and stuff. And so, you know, had our algorithms sort of know about that. And so it kind of helps us. And then finally, you know, being sort of CS people, you know, we decided to try to turn this into a big data problem where we're going to correct a, a lot of information across the data center and then crunch on it and figure out what the clocks should be and then adjust the clocks with that. And so this is pretty different than, you know, like most of the other protocols that tend to look at a local or pairwise type of thing. And, you know, we got away with it since we're working in a data center. Okay. So it turns out pretty much every clock synchronization algorithm works about the same way. They send messages between the machines, letting other people know what time it is and stuff. And so you're going you're gonna to have sort of this idea we're going to send a probe message from one machine to another. Let's say we know there's some time, we're at time T here. If we're running on machine A here, um, we can assume the clock is sort of off by some amount. We'll call that amount delta TA. And so if we send a packet out, it'll get a timestamp on it of TA here, which is T plus delta TA. 
that message goes from A to machine B and then gets time stamped when it arrives at B. Um, that and we can say it's time, um, time is going to be the real time plus delta TB, which is the error in B's clock. So now we, we have the, these two values um, of time. So, uh, so our time, our, the time stamps we're going to get out of here are Tx of A, which is the transmit time for that probe, and then uh, Rx of B, which is the received time of probe B. In our system and a lot of other ones, you know, it seems the obvious thing to turn around and send a message back the other uh, direction, so we do that. So we get a probe that goes back. So now we have a TXB, the transmit side of B, and RXA on A. One of the things we were playing around with was, you know, um, how do we actually time these things? Yes? Uh, are you saying anything about um, time data structure you're using? Are you using a time.h as the convention from a BSD that sort of propagated through time? or? Yeah, so the question was, are we using something like uh, BSD's definition of time and stuff? Um, not really. We have some kind of notion of um, ultimately of you know how many ticks of an oscillator has at some level. Of, uh, it's integer. Yeah. Well, yeah. It will be once our big data is done with it. It'll it might be a floating point number, but yeah, ultimately it's going to be an integer. So anyhow, um, we actually ended up uh, playing around with trying to get pretty accurate times of transmit and times of receive. You know, something like NTP in a sort of normal pro um, program might like look at a, uh, the cu current time of day clock and then call a system call to send a packet out. You know, that it includes in the transmit time, you know, all the time going through the OS stack and going through the driver and things like that. And that adds a lot of kind of noise and jitter in the thing. We want to try to do, do this a little finer. And so one way, one thing we did, we found a lot of the modern NICs actually have ability to timestamp packets when they put them on the wire. Actually use this for a protocol called TT. PTP that I'll talk about later, but it was useful for us since you get some something where the NIC is, you know, can do a very precise measurement of when this thing is sort of launched into the network. It can do a similar thing on the receive, where as soon as it receives things, it gets the timestamp of it. So we use that in um, in our um, first version of the protocol. It turns out that if your um, your machine, you know, NIC does not support this ability to timestamp packets. Linux will kind of do it for it in the driver. So what it'll do is when you go to transmit something, it'll read the you know the clock in the computer and record that for you. And it receives it as soon as the Linux gets control, it will record that. You know, this is called in Linux software timestamps in the networking thing. Uh, we can use that, but to give you a feel for like you're now, you just have the jitter of a driver running and you know, interrupt processing and stuff. We get kind of bumps us up to sort of microsecond level synchronization. Um, that's still good for some of the things we want to do. And uh, you know, when we, for example, try to run on a cloud that doesn't provide us that kind of low level access to the NIC, we can just use that. Okay, so back to where we are. It, it turns out that you, if you send a packet, you can think of the receive time being the when you sent it plus how long it took to go through the network. So in our um, in a system, um, we received it at RxB my, and minus the delta B, um, and the transmit time was uh, TXA minus delta A, and then the delay was basically how long did it take this packet to go through the network and any cues and the switches or whatever happens in the network and stuff. 
If you start just playing around with the math, you can end up getting the delta B, uh, TB and delta A on one side of it and everything else on the other. And then it's a pretty safe bet that the network's not instantaneous. It's going to take some amount of positive time to propagate through the wires and the switches. So you get this relationship that delta TB minus delta TA, and so that's the error in the two clocks, is less than the two timestamps that we um, subtracted from each other like that. So we have an upper bound. If you do the same math on the return um, um, probe, you actually um, um, get a lower bound um, for that delta um, TB minus delta 2A. So now you have a bound. You know it's between those two of it. And so if you were to look at this, yeah. Isn't, isn't it the case that you're subtracting that small T on both sides, but you're sampling the T twice, right? Then you know that the original source has been built in. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good point. The question is, the question is um, you, you actually read the clock on the same machine sort of multiple times. And so because you're on the same clock, you'll get some values and you know a little bit about their relationships to one another. And the clock is monotonically increasing and it's going at a, uh, it, it's, rate may vary, but it doesn't, as it turns out, it's not going to vary dramatically over that um, interval. So the sampling is actually happening on two different machines. Right, so each of those is consistent, but I thought you were asking about... The same. Yeah, so you, you can't know anything about the two, the ones on different machines, but within the same machine, you do. Okay, okay. so if we were to look at this um, in a graph, and so here's a graph that shows sort of time on the x-axis going from zero to two seconds, and this value of a delta T a, a B minus delta T A. And so each of these dots represents points either in the lower, green in the lower bound or uh, blue in the upper bound. And so you see something kind of interesting happening. You basically see the, um, this askew between the, the two um, clocks. And so, you know, when this two second interval started out, the clocks were like 93.3 microseconds apart in their offset. And after two seconds, you know, you look here and the offset's now up to 96.6. You know, and so that's basically meaning these sort of clocks are running at a different speed in these two machines. And in fact, by looking at this, we can figure out the, effectively the slope of this line. It's basically losing 1.65 microseconds per second as it's going on. So when I said we're going to look at sort of modeling what's happening with the crystal oscillators and stuff, it's this idea that we basically have both the offset here, what they're wrong, but also what that clock is doing relative to the other clocks in the system. Okay. So it turns out that if we, rather than looking at two seconds, we kind of looked over longer periods of time. Uh, the idea that you have a line or a slope and stuff sort of breaks down. And this is our temperature effect coming in. Um, you know, over a 60 second interval, things can heat up and the clock starts going slight. So you start seeing these sort of obviously non-linear sort of upper and lower bounds going on. And so, you know, the, so we basically see this, we know what it happens. It, it turns out that what we've been able to do is say, look, over two second intervals, it appears to be fairly linear, you know, because, you know, basically it's a heat sort of thing happening. It doesn't happen instantly. But over longer intervals, it's not. So we're going to sort of start looking at things over two second intervals 
and then make our adjustment decisions based on that. And that way we ha can assume things are linear since that's we're gonna be using just the slope of it and um, offset and slope, but um, adjust this every two seconds. And it seems to be working pretty well of treating this thing as a piecewise linear curve. Okay, so basically in order for our algorithm to work, um, what we're going to do is get this data and what we want to do is find that red line which is like sort of the both the offset and the slope of between these two clocks here and so if we can find this line we now you know have a lot of information about what is happening with time on that machine um, so the, basically the um, three things we sort of figured out was um, one of which was uh, why don't we you know, use, well, everybody uses machine learning for, you know, especially if you want to get funded for something. You know, it's like a basically, you know, so we picked out this um, support vector machine algorithm, which is a sort of machine learning classifier, and we can use that to run the, on the data to sort of find out, given all these probes, what's the sort of middle line between those um, two sort of upper and lower bounds. And as we'll see, it turned out that it didn't work as well as we had really hoped. It wasn't like a panacea that you could just throw the data at it and it gave you the right answer. In fact, it kind of gave you the wrong answer if you had too much messiness in the data and we ended up having some messiness in the data. So we came up with an idea to sort of filter the mess, uh, messiness out called coded probes. and then. Finally, you know, where our big data comes in is once we've collected all this, we're going to bring it into a centralized coordinator that can then look over the entire data center clocks and do some fine tuning on our uh, um, clock adjustments. So here's the problem we ran into. We collect some data. We kind of ran the SVM on it and we ended up getting lines that kind of did something, but if you see all those points in the middle there, those are impossible. You know, like basically it implies that somehow the message went faster than it could propagate through the network. And so there's actually the reasons for this, are there are the various ones, um, you know, but basically the mechanisms we're using for time stamping and stuff um, had some kind of problems with you know, what we will. You know, signal processing people would call that noise, but it was basically just wrong. And so, um, you know, like, so basically we had stuff in the middle here that shouldn't be there. Some of the other things, these, when we have times that take longer, are you can kind of explain, like, the, we're going through a network, it could run into other things. There's like dark packets going around your network that the network folks you know, try to hide from you, you can run into and all, you know, all these things. We're looking for kind of minimum times, but we see all these other ones. So what we, can, what we do see here is pretty good. We see this sort of, there's a the whole kind of thick line of things along the minimum. We just got to get the SVM thing to try to like, you know, parse it out for us. So it turns out that if you just ran SVM and stuff and did this, we ended up getting uh, sort of our clocks synced down to a few hundred um, nanoseconds. It was better than you know the other systems, but not as good as we'd kind of hoped to do. Um, basically, the, the um, SVMs aren't good for if you have like errors in your data. So anyhow, how do we sort of figure out and delete these things came the problem. And so we use this idea that some other people had sort of done in networking is rather than sending just one probe, we would send two probe packets spaced by some fixed amount of time, like 10 microseconds. So now we have this pair of packets that are going from one um, machine to another. There's a couple possibilities that can happen, one of which is um, if they arrive at the destination and they're more than 10 microseconds apart, something happened. You know, basically, the tail packet got delayed more than the front packet. So 
That's not a good thing for us. So we can basically sort of ignore that case. Yes? <laughs> the other possibility is they're sort of pushed together. You can see how this one would happen. There's a queue in the network. I send the probes there. The first packet hits the queue. The second packet hits the queue. And they get like jammed together. And then they show up at the destination like that. We want, we want to get rid of those anyhow, since they're not good minimum measurements for us. So we're going to drop those as well. So the final one is these things come up, are approximately 10 microseconds apart. It's possible that something bad happened and they arrived like that, but it's much more likely that they didn't get any kind of bad stuff happening and then they kind of went through in sort of the minimum time. So what this allowed us to do is basically take this and then um, you know, filter it so it dropped almost all the sort of bad things. When we now run the SVM, on it, we get some pretty good bounds, you know, something that kind of tightly hu hugs the two sort of points of, you know, ma of the maximum, you know, upper bound and the lower bound. And, and then what we can do is basically get the SVM to tell us what's right down the middle of that. And now we have the red line we want for our algorithm. Yes? Maybe it's just my eyes fooling me, but is there some sort of effect on this outlier the form lines or? Just lack of enough samples. The ones that are below the green line, for example, are they sort of lining up a little bit? Um, we haven't really looked at that. I, we think it's just sort of random. You know, you know. I mean, obviously, if the kind of things that caused that is somehow the queuing happened, yet the the pro coded probe didn't delete it or something like that, since it's taking a lot longer than it should. I don't. Know, do you know? No. So I think the accident just ended up having the same delay. I don't think the range is sort of, yeah, bad. Yeah. So, you know, Balaji didn't really have a theory that there's something going on there. So anyhow, um, this worked well, basically. It allowed us to, like, toss out all, like, 90% of the bad data. And the, the clock sync was now much better. It's a factor of four better than it was with just the raw SVM. OK. Yeah. So what's causing that last 10% of bad data? You know, so, so what's causing that last 10% of bad data? The, the issue is we're, we're, we're calling something bad when the, the, both of the probe, you know, the pair of uh, coded probes come in and they aren't 10 microseconds apart. Uh, I assume what happens is there's something that can go wrong in your network where you delay packets and still have them both, you know, the coded pairs, you know, still show up 10 microseconds difference, you know. You know, the simple case of queuing typically doesn't have that. So, you know, like it's going to be something weird happening. Okay. So, you know, the way the clock sync algorithms work is you basically probe some other machines. And we ended up doing this approach where we had each server in the, um, in the, in the data center probe K other servers where K was you know, on our high-end system was 20 and then the one gigabyte one was 10. So something along that lines. It turns out that uh, Regardless of how big your data center is, these numbers are plenty are plenty well, are plenty big to make the scheme work. So it doesn't have, um, it, it's not, um, you know, it's not it doesn't scale with the K doesn't scale with the size of the data center. We also set it up so that every 500 um, microseconds we would send one of these coded probes. You know, out. So we're now sending data out much, much more frequently than NTP did. Uh, it's still, you know, this thing was a 40 gigabit length in this network, so it was basically using almost no bandwidth of it and things, but we're sending a lot of packets in this thing. So basically, what ha ends up happening is both sides get all these timestamps things. 
they can actually locally, um, you know, obviously locally process the coded probes and drop the things they weren't, and then it actually can run the VM themselves, and so what happens is we have all the machines now, you know, process this data, and then it can report back, you know, just effectively the offset and slope that it found for each pair of machines it probes. So we get a fair amount of, you know, great reduction in data and distributing all the work around, and then we ship back a small amount of data to a coordinator now, so it has, for every pair of machines that are probing each other, this offset and, and um, slope data. So here's what the coordinator does, is basically it gets all the data, and it can do this kind of neat trick. If it, if it knows that A probes B, it can look at that, and so to say, well, you know, if, if, if um, A thinks its clock is 10, it knows from its um, offset data that it, B's clock must be 1015. And then what happens is B um, is probing C, and the same thing happens here is B, if B is at 1015, C must be at um, 1005. And then finally, when we wrap back around, by the cycle in the graph, um, basically we, we, we have this thing where um, either they add up or they don't add up. And if they don't add up, you know there's some error in there. You know, you basically get, you know, and, and in fact, you know, the way the sort of probe, probe gaff was generated with 10 to 20 random you know, things, you, know, you end up with lots of these cycles and stuff you can go around. And, and so you get all these things. Now, you know, what, what we do with that is try to figure out, well, where did we mess up? We can sort of guess. We know that somehow, somewhere along that um, loop, we're off by 10 minutes in this case, so we can guess it's Two, two, and six, or or something like negative ten, five, and fifteen could be, you know, like pretty much anything. But what we ended up doing was just uh, like a not knowing anything different, just sort of equally dividing it up, saying, well, we'll put one third to each, you know, each of these and adjust it. Yes. I'm sorry. Can you earlier uh, picture? Did you vary the? Uh, I guess the gap between the coded um, probe. Uh, I'm not sure. Did we ever vary that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, the question yeah. was that we, I, I mentioned we were using 10 microseconds between it. Did we try other values and did it make any difference? Uh, the, the, the 10 microseconds is an example number, meaning it's very hard to send two packets based 10 microseconds that itself is an effort. So we actually sent them back to back. And sometimes they're 10 microseconds apart, sometimes 6.7. We don't really care. Uh, whatever the gap was, it's taken us to transmit timestamp. And we did play not with uh, the spacing between them. That doesn't almost doesn't matter. It just needs to be close enough. We also tried, you know, if two does something good, why don't we do three? You know, three-quarter probes. Uh, you're just doing extra work and not really getting a lot of benefit. So this is this has the feel. Why stop at 10-way 10, 10 probing or something? Same thing. You could do more in the next couple of slides you might see. It doesn't really pay off. So there are trade-offs here. Yeah. The amount of work you do and the amount of benefit you get. Yeah, so a summary of the answer is we tried a bunch of things that didn't seem to have a big effect like and you know we just basically sent two packets back to back and you know figured out what the time was when we sent it. Yes? For this graph, you know, instead of just assigning them equally wouldn't, you know, since you have sent a lot of stuff, wouldn't one of those edges be common with some other cycle, basically, and then you could do some kind of a consistency? Yes. You know, so. The next slide. Oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Yes, correct. Okay, so, yeah, so the picture here is you end up with, like, overlap things. So, so now we have, like, multiple corona correction things going on, and so we now get a chance to even further... Um, you know, but the more sort of cycles you have, the more you can sort of fine tune things. And as Balaji pointed out, here's a graph that shows the sort of errors we were seeing, both the mean and the 99th percentile. 
as we varied k. And so as k started getting you know, up until 10 or so, it, it, you, know, you, you saw some improvement. But after that, it, it really didn't get much of a win over, over it. So that's why you know, we're sort of you know, have that number 10 to 20 uh, you know, that, that we use. Yeah, anyhow, um, yeah. So I have some, you know, we decided to like do some comparison to NTP. And so um, to try to make NTP not be so totally unfair of, since it's sending from user level and stuff, we sort of modified it so that it used the, the NIC timestamping mechanism to get its timestamps so it has sort of accurate things and stuff. And so the, what this shows is sort of like different things. If there's no load on the network, you know, this is a, should be a good case for everybody since you send your probes out and they're not hit, likely to hit anything and so they'll just go through it at minimum time. Um, we, we were getting sort of uh, sync times around 10 nanoseconds and 99th percentile of um, 18. Um, NTP, since it doesn't sync as often, doesn't have all the fancy global and data processing was in the hundreds of nanoseconds. Um, when you start cranking the load up and stuff, and you know, the, um, NTP really goes, you know, obviously it's not sending that many probes, and when they hit it delays, it, you know, bad things happen, and so you get really big numbers for it. Whereas we, we do pretty well, even up to 80 and 90% load, we can still, we're sending all these packets, you know, if you're running a 90% load, we're gonna like have what we call impure probes that run in the, when the pair runs into them. But just enough get through that we're still able to sort of, you know, get another you know, SVM to sort of draw us uh, offset and, and slope and you know, the clock sync sort of works for us. So. Um, you know, we, we, we sort of did that, and then, you know, the 99th percentile, even at 80% per, load is, you know, was 32 nanoseconds. One of the things we've been kind of impressed with is we've actually been talking to people with sort of da um, data centers in, in, in the fintech area, and they basically have these data centers. They don't run their network at very high utilization and stuff, and when they run this clock sync, they report back like single digit nanosecond sort of syncs between the machines since you know, not you know, and they're really pleased about it, you know, that. So it seems to be doing pretty well out in the field. They don't think that their signals aren't propagating more than ten feet at a nanosecond? If it's I mean everybody in architecture knows that a nanosecond is a is basically a foot. Thirty thirty uh, centimeters. Yeah. And, and they don't. They don't. That's the round trip time. the error they're trying to do. Yeah. So basically, it's, it's trying to. We're, you know, one way to view it is we're taking a ton of data and sort of figuring out what the clock offset is. We can actually. You know, one of the things we're ending up getting is we're getting. Um, errors that are uh, rates that are below the sort of clock period that some of the other machines you know use, since that, so that you know it's like kind of showing where you know the CS people are eating the world. You know, you basically get you know a whole bunch of data. You, you know, compared to these other things that are trying to precisely time packets going through the network, we're and we're kind of trouncing them. So. A little bit about what's sort of going on here. Um, one of which is, um, and this is what's really is interest me in of it. It's so many years when you write a distributed algorithm, you never worried about, you know, or even thought about the possibility of having synchronized clocks and stuff. So, you know, having something like this has been fun to think about. You know, what would you do differently if you had this common notion of this? You know, being a systems person. Uh, making that decision that I'm going to count on 
a clock sink in my data center, that's a big one. It's a, it's a, you know, like basically, you know, if you want to make sure you absolutely can always count on it and stuff, and if it, the clock sink fails, your algorithm fails, it means you have to make that thing super reliable and stuff. So it's a scary thing to do, but as a research, it's sort of interesting to see, what, see if we can figure out what the win would be if you decided to actually have this as a primitive in your data center where you, know, you could assume a common thing about clocks. You know, when we talk to the people at Google that do time there and stuff, I was really struck. You know, I think working in time too long makes you weird, but in and out, that's a side. But anyhow, you know, you ask them what time it is, they don't say what time it is. They give you a confidence interval. Well, I believe the time is between those, two, you know, these values. As a software abstraction, that kind of works really well because you know, you, you ask what time it is and it'll give you something. If their clock sync kind of goes on the fritz, they can have the confidence interval to start to grow based on the maximum sort of, you know, skew they have and the whole system continues to work as opposed to like dropping over dead. And so, you know, it's going to be interesting what they call true time, I think is probably the right sort of abstraction where when you ask what time you get two times, you know, where it's somewhere in between there with a very, very high probability. Well, anyhow, so what started us doing this is we're interested in trying to do what's known as network tomography, where you basically send packets into the network and time how long it takes and then try to infer what's happening in the network. And you know, with this clock sync, we were able to do that pretty well, where we could figure out what the queues were in the switches in the network. We could even figure out the content of the queues in the switches and stuff. Um, you know, this, the people that made switches weren't so impressed as they tried to do that with some kind of in-band telemetry and stuff like that. But you know, it's, it's pretty nice. We're sitting on the edge there. We don't have the stream of data coming out of all the switches, and we're still computing the same information. And things. So, uh, you know, that, that worked out pretty well, a system we called Simon. Uh, the other place it's known to work, and we've been playing around with this as well, is database consistency. You know, the idea of Google Spanner, which, you know, everybody was doing these databases that had relaxed consistency models, and, you know, the assumption is the programmer would deal with, like, eventual consistency and stuff, and they decided, no, we're going to throw that out of the window, we'll provide sequential consistency, and you don't have to worry about what happens if you have, you know, inconsistent data spanner. One of the things, that it, it turned out that, um, you know, that's good for this kind of thing is order. It's ordering things in a distributed system. If you have a timestamp service that gives you a timestamp, so you can get an order of things. And this actually landed, um, you know, our group along with the Nasdaq on the front page of the New York Times, since it was basically, you know, they got really excited about it and stuff of what what this would mean to like these trading venues and stuff. To their notion of fairness, you know, is now we can stamp, you know, time, you know, time on everything that comes in and order them things with it. Is that and. You know, there's other places people have talked about this thing, you know, like if you've ever d d tried to debug a distributed program and tried to you know, get timestamps from all the different nodes and they're not ordered, you kind of can't even tell what sort of happened in it. And you know, obviously, you know, syncing would benefit from that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a related work here. You know, like what, what are the alternatives to the approach we're doing? A lot of them uh, involve you know, some kind of specialized hardware you would do with it. You could start with the saying, why, don't, why do you have these crappy clocks? Why don't you have a clock that doesn't really lose time, you know, vary and stuff like that? And, uh, you know, it turns out for even quartz crystals, you can pay some more money and buy one that sort of tries to keep itself at the same temperature and isolate itself from vibrations and all the other things that could mess up a quartz crystal and does a lot better. It actually, for the ones I was looking at, it didn't seem to fix the problem here, at least the, the, if you vary the temperature a lot, it doesn't like drop off the end of a quadratic curve like the or the uncorrected one, we're still going to have problems with it. 
if you were to able to make little atomic clocks, you know, those things, you know, that come in at a few nanoseconds per second, um, sort of, you know, skew. So, you know, if you were to sync them up, you could run for a pretty long time before they kind of, you know, got, went off the rails. Uh, it, I guess it's still, a, you know, we were out looking for these things. You can't buy them super cheap. It's not going to drop, replace coarse crystals anytime soon um, in, in data centers. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is they can't be mounted. You know, it's not, they're sort of always external mm -hmm. is the other, other problem. Yeah, so the Balaji points out that it's getting in a form factor so it fits on your motherboard. It's going to yeah. be a challenge, you know, for, uh, for atomic yeah, clock. They're, they're working on, on that. The, the military wants them for portable radios. Yeah. For syncing up the DARPA computer. added program on that. Sugar cube site. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we've you know you know heard talk of people trying to build. Um, I was talking to a physics professor here who claimed that you could do it. You know, you know just for, you know I don't, but. I don't know, maybe the, the practice is harder than the theory. The cable from, from the big clock over in the corner is cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so pointing out that the way people currently use atomic clocks is you have one of them and you have you know, everybody go and talk to it to get a uh, really accurate time. You know. So um, the networking people decided they wanted to get in the clock sync business, and so there's a protocol, a standard called Precision Time Protocol, PTP. The way it works is, um, and we, we were seeing part of it already, the NICs, when you go to send a packet out, timestamp it, and when they receive it, they timestamp it. They also have all the switches sort of set up so when a packet comes in, it times how long it was in the switch before sending it out. And so what the whole system's a little bit complicated, but what it can do is get pretty accurate measurement of how long it took for a packet to go from one machine to another. And based on that, you can try to sort of synchronize the, the clocks on the, uh, on the things. Um, we, this one has actually been deployed pretty widely. You'll see a lot of the vendors have PTP compatible switches, and we've seen them in data centers and, and stuff like that, especially in fintech area and stuff. Um, those people are interested in our stuff, um, since, so it obviously means that thing is not perfect for them. Um, I think part of the problem is, you know, it's, it's um, you're trying to measure individual packets that are going through and get times. It means you have some clock there that you're reading, and, and when it goes into the switch and it comes out, like what is that clock doing? You know, in terms of its, you know, varying in frequency and stuff like that. And then you get one like one sample and trying to make sort of things of it. It, it sort of pales in comparison to this big data approach that we're looking at, and and stuff. Um, we, we did, you know, like, really like what they have done for the NICs in that most all the modern NICs will try to participate in PTP by time stamping packets when they send it on the Y. That's, that's a local clock, right? Yes, you yeah. Coordinate that clock with your system clock. Yes, yes, exactly. That's what the way they sort of use it in that configuration. They have a command that you synchronize the clocks in the NIC and then pull it into the host machine. Um, there's another system that people use that involves, it's called uh, pulse per second PPS. Uh, this one involves like putting an antenna out and listening to GPS satellites. And the system involves you have the antenna on the roof and then you have the leads from the antenna go to your machines. They have little splitters and stuff that goes down. And then you need to know the length of all those wires. You figure it out. And then you get the pulse um, from the GPS satellite. You got to know the distance from your antenna to the GPS satellite. And um, oh yeah, it turns out humidity um, it goes at different speeds, but depending on like how the weather and stuff. So you need to try to factor that in. It turns out if you put all those things together, you can get quite accurate time sync. And, you know, obviously, if you want to do time sync over globally, you know, that, that is a way you could actually do it. Um, you know, the, the, um, 
the people that have deployed that were kind of unhappy that you have now have to want, run this separate network in your data center that has to have very precision wires and stuff like that. Mentioned uh, costs in the tens of millions of dollars to do, so they weren't happy about that part. There's another concern the fintech people have. Anytime you play with money, they worry about people attacking you, and uh, GPS is pretty easy to spoof. And so um, you know, there's, there, that's not a good thing for it, um, it there. So, you know, it's interesting. If you're a, a physicist and you uh, wanted to solve this problem, you might just drag a wire between the different machines and you know how long the wire is, how fast the bits go, you know, go over it and just sort of send things around that way. And I guess some people were doing that at CERN and figured out FinTech people would be interested in it. So there's a system called White Rabbit that's based on that sort of idea of deploying a specialized network that you then just do time sync over by sending things around. They report really like low numbers, like sub um, nanoseconds sort of syncing using, using this sort of system and stuff. So we know. Interesting. The, the thing that we like about what we're doing, it's a software system. It doesn't really depend on having a separate network and stuff like that um, on it. So in terms of future directions, um, as I mentioned, um, you know, we did this work and suddenly there was all these people in the industry, uh, particularly fintech and stuff, really kind of clamoring to say, can we get this and stuff. And, so it didn't really make sense for a university project to do it. So Balaji and his students this, um, founded a company called TikTok Networks, is sort of offering it up to them and doing stuff in this area. Um, and so that is sort of exciting stuff. You know, the research here, uh, and, um, we're continuing to sort of look at sort of the implications of having this. We're going through the distributed algorithms we know about and saying, okay, you have these clocks synchronized to this level, what can we do with it and stuff. You know, part of my motivation for doing this talk was that to throw this out and if you happen to have some application, you think, boy, it'd be nice if the clocks were synchronized. You know, we'd love to talk to you. We're looking, you know, we got systems for sort of doing this. So please contact us. Yes? Yeah, actually, I wrote a paper a little bit about this, but multi-process was about two decades ago. <laughs> Yeah, I can then so. You know, if you look at sort of the ugly sort of um, security problems we've seen lately, at the root of a lot of them is time. You look at all the kind of Intel's, you know, sort of nightmare with Spectre and Meltdown and stuff like that. At some point, somebody timed something and discovered something in it. So, you know, it's not, yeah, I can see where, you know, this even things that might be a scary thing for a <laughs> scary you know, point of view to have this new capability in the system. Yes? Did you try um, making NTP synchronize more than once a minute to see what the effect would be? Yes. Um, we don't, but people obviously do that. There are actually people that sell um, products to FinTech, which are just NTP with that, you know, you can actually just set the, in the config file, tell it, I think it goes down to eight seconds or something like that, but, you know, just uh, and even the stock release, and you can crank that down even more. Yeah. For the comparison, it was done every two seconds, the, the, the table you saw. Oh, it was, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, so, yeah, it would obviously have been way worse if you would let it drift for a minute before correcting. Mm -hmm. So there's a, another layer that I, I didn't see the, how do you filter this stuff that you, you're getting all this data mm -hmm. and your clock is, is going tick, 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 but maybe its frequency is changing because the temperature is changing. How do you filter out the noise and the samples you're getting? So the question is, how do we filter out the noise and the samples? You know, so 
we're taking getting a ton of probes coming in and the, what comes out of those machines is just an offset and slope so you know tremendous reduction in filtering and stuff so you know any kind of bad stuff hopefully it was just sort of wiped out by that mechanism and stuff so the amount of data we're actually passing around is small it's like two floating point numbers per pair of machines Yes. Does this allow you to build cheaper machines? The question is, does this allow you to build cheaper machines? You know, obviously, if somebody said we're going to have you buy an atomic clock for each you know, motherboard, yeah, this would be a cheaper solution for it. Um, you know, essentially, I don't think people pay very much for their crystal oscillators these days. Even the good ones are, are pretty cheap. Um, so, concluding slide. Um, one of the things that we've been excited about it is, you know, what does it mean now if you can have a data center where the clocks are within, say, 10 nanoseconds of one another? You know, what, what, what can you do? You know, obviously, you know, the, the service where you wanted to be able to globally order things is suddenly available as time stamping as a service. Um, you know, this is, it's been fun to be the software person, especially when the competitors are either physicists from CERN or networking people, you know, trying to build switches and stuff. It's a good place to be, have a total software end-to-end -end system. And, you know, it kind of works and you can even, you know, argue and prove things about how it scales and stuff. And then, you know, there's, you know, what, just to conclude, you know, we basically collected a lot of um, this probe data, used SVMs to try to, you know, extract out the information we needed. We t used coded probes to make sure that SVMs didn't go off the rails. And, and then we have these global, you know, sort of algorithms that run on things. So I think that's all I had. Obviously, there were some questions, but I'm happy to take more.